Paris, how are we doing? Feeling good about things? Good day so far? So everyone's talking about machine learning and deep learning, so I named this talk about one of the most interesting neural networks. That's the one in your head. And I'm actually gonna talk about two, I'm gonna talk around this ecosystem of technology, and I think it's a, it's a good placement between the, the Ansible talk you just heard and, and the Mesos talk you're gonna hear next. So they say you're uh, not supposed to introduce yourself, and also you're supposed to make one point really, really well. I'm not very good at taking advice, so, and I'm a narcissist, so I'm gonna introduce myself, and then I'm gonna make a bunch of points really, really poorly. So buckle up, we're gonna have a good time. So I'm Andrew Clay Schaefer. Like he said, I've been working on Puppet, um, OpenStack, and, and now Cloud Foundry for about 10 years. Um, before that, I did some venture-funded startups as well. But it's just sort of this theme of automating systems, automating systems, automating systems. And then this is artisanal retrofuturism crossed with, whoops, what did, 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 did. retrofuturism crossed with team scale anarcho syndicalism, which I know you all know is the best methodology for developing software. You should go look into that. I wrote a book for O'Reilly on web operations. I've been part of the DevOps Days um, organization for. Uh, since it started, and I've also been part of the Velocity Conference in organizing it, and I'm really glad that Pivotal pays my expenses. Now, I said I'm a narcissist. This is the most important slide. This is my Twitter handle, so you can refer to that later. And then, also for your benefit, I look very different. So if you see me in my, one of my various shapes, then you can come up and introduce yourself, and I'm still the same person. So moving on. I have uh, given a lot of talks. These are on the internet. You can watch them. I'm available for birthdays, weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever you need. Uh, come talk to me later. So everyone wants the DevOps. It's like this buzzword everyone talks about, it, right? And that to me as, you know, just sort of sounds like pandas vomiting rainbows. It's somewhat inactionable, very nebulous. I have definition for DevOps, what it means to me, and I'm going to share that with you as we move through this. But this is the conversation that I see a lot of people having. So where are we and how did we get here? In 2007, this blog post was orig originally written by Jesse Robbins. And Jesse Robbins was a person who did ops at Amazon. And he's also uh, one of the original co-founders of Chef. And the point of this blog post is that on the left, you have traditional operations. And it's saying that maybe you can get things into production sooner. And on the right, you have the new secret sauce operations, and maybe it takes you a little bit longer to get in production, but they have very different scaling characteristics with respect to the number of hours they're gonna be spent maintaining those systems as you scale the number of servers. So on the y-axis, you have the number of hours being spent, and on the x-axis, you have the number of servers. This was, this was something that we said 10 years ago, right? So I have said this literally for 10 years. You can either Easily manage complex systems at scale, dun, 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 or you can't. And I used to say that about Puppet. I used to say that about things. And now there's all these other tools, and, and you, I'm sure you're aware of, of many of them. But it, this is not news, right? So there's this, there's this thing that, that has to change. What has to change? Well, what has to change is our behavior, right? And I'm going to come back to making that point over and over. And in, in my time... You know, personally, I'm fascinated with performance, high-performing systems, building high-performing systems, and also building high-performing teams. And what I came to notice, and this is, you know, with Puppet, this is with uh, other projects I was a part of, that you could give the same tools and the same advice to what looked like very similar teams, and they would get drastically different results. And, and that theme has to do with how they learn, how they change their behavior given new information. So I started where, and, and this is, uh, I, I saw some of the slides that you just saw with this notion of automate all the things. And this is back when, you know, I had, I had the, the magic power of Puppet and I could automate anything, literally anything. Just give it to me, I could automate it, I got this, automate all the things. But what I've come to realize is that is not actually the best strategy, right? What you automate is as important as that you automate. And the things that you automate might fight against being automated. And the things that you automate, it might be more complexity added to that. So sometimes it's more important to revisit the architecture and simplify that. And I'm just going to give you a little example of what I mean. So this is automation, right? That's automation. That's not automation. Right? That's a human. This is someone, someone has to do work to make something happen. This, <laughs> this is automation, right? So I got, I got this thing, it's connected to this other thing, 
and then it does some stuff, and then the thing happens, and then there's MongoDB, and then it breaks, and I don't know how to fix it, and the robot doesn't know how to fix it either, and humans have to get involved. So I'm sure some of you have lived this. Some of you probably have that in production right now. I know I have, or maybe you're about to live this. And now you got containers. So we're gonna just schedule containers everywhere. We're just gonna bin pack our automation. It's gonna be awesome. And if Tetris has taught me anything, it's the errors pile up and the conflicts disappear. <laughs> so why, why am I even doing anything? Why? Like, what is that stuff? I think that sometimes as a technologist, we get really enamored with our tools, but we're serving some larger purpose. We're serving some, some higher thing. Why does this exist? We'll come back to this. So this is my little gratuitous foray into game theory. Pareto and efficient Nash equilibria rule everything around you. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you some definitions. A Pareto and efficient situation is one where there are changes that will benefit someone without detriment to anyone. So some new allocation, some new payoff will benefit someone and no one will lose. But a Nash equilibrium means no one will change their strategy. That's a definition that someone won a Nobel Prize for. No one will change it because according to the payoffs of the game, there's no benefit to changing. It's true by definition. No one will change. No one will change. And this is an is a example from evolution. So this evolution does not see gradual changes. This, it's non-existent in the fossil record. You see periods of rapid change and then stability for millions of years. And those are usually associated with some kind of geologic change, some sort of climate change, right? Because this fossil record comes in sudden jumps and, this might be important to your startup, extinction events. Because what's happening in those evolutionary stasia, it's an equilibrium as well, right? The punctuated equilibrium, there's no benefit to changing. There's no benefit to evolving. But if you keep playing the same way when there is a change in the climate, when there's a change in the rest of the environment, then you're going to lose. So what is the DevOps, right? Everyone says this word. This is a blog post I wrote in 2010 that I'm going to just summarize really quickly. To me, at the time I wrote it in 2010, DevOps meant that developers and operations can and should work together, right? That, that was a... At the time, it was a bold statement, right? Because there's all these people and they just go to work and have fights all day. Um, system administration was evolving to look more like software development. So if I write against an API to provision machines, I write against an API to configure machines, I write against an API to monitor machines, I write against an API to do everything that has to do with operations, that looks suspiciously like software development. And finally, and I think this is the most important point, the most powerful point, that this was evolving together as a global community sharing solutions. So the things like DevOps Days and Velocity brought together the people that were building these systems, that were building the internet. I had a very privileged front row seat. DevOps was very good to me. I got to watch all these things be built with these tools. And my ability to solve problems was multiplied and magnified by the fact that I could get people from that community in, in Slack, in IRC, on email, right? And they would respond to me. They respond to you too. So this is also a nice framing. And if you're not familiar with this, I just think it's a nice way to frame things. Culture, automation, lean, metrics, and sharing. And sometimes people say it without the lean, but I just think calm sounds better than cam. So I add in lean. And I also think there's a lot of great ideas from lean. If you're not familiar with, with Deming and some of the ideas in lean, then maybe you should familiarize yourself. I'll come back to that uh, slightly in a bit. But what's the real theme is that what's happening, software is eating the world. Software is affecting everything. I didn't bring my phone out here, but often I'll, I'll hold up a phone and, I'll, and I'll, I'll say that this phone, and you guys have phones in your pocket right now, the phone in your pocket is a supercomputer. The phone in your pocket is faster than any computer on this planet when I was born. Might have been faster than any computer on the planet when you were born, depending on how old you are. Some of you are probably kind of young. And that's changing everything. Not just the computer, it's connected to a high-speed network that has the sum of all human knowledge, right? We have access to this amazing thing. I push a button, a car comes and gets me. I push a button, people bring me food. It's awesome. So we're, we're optimizing human performance, experience operating software with software. This is what DevOps, we're optimizing operating software with software and with humans. 
Software is changing everything, including software. And it's also changing organizations. So when people talk about microservices, whatever, like it has to do with how your people talk to each other. And what I'm gonna state is if this trend is true, and I believe it's true, that you're either building a software business or you're losing to someone who is. Or the way I will frame it even stronger, and I believe this is true from watching you know, the example that you give people the same tools, the same advice, and they get different results, that you're either building an, a learning organization or you're gonna lose to someone who is on some time scale. So everyone wants the DevOps. What they actually want though, everyone says this word, you know, maybe they rub some tools on it. But what they really want is scalability, availability, reliability, operability, usability, all for free, and, and add in all the illities that you can think of and probably security and some other things. And they want to do it without changing anything. <laughs> like I literally had that conversation. I sp they paid me a lot of money to come sit and talk to them and interview you know, go through their process, go through their tech stack, and then I told them exactly what I thought they should do to get better results, and they said, well, what can we do without changing anything? It's like, just pay me, I'm out. <laughs> Good luck, have fun. So these are the buzzwords, everyone says these buzzwords, right? Every blog post, every Twitter, whatever. But I'm gonna argue this is one thing. Like this is all an emergent phenomenon. This is the new dominant paradigm. These are the patterns. Everyone wants to continuously DevOps microservices. <laughs> or die trying. <laughs> These patterns have proven successful building and operating highly available systems with predictable scaling and failure characteristics. You have, like Netflix exists as an existence proof. Google exists, Amazon exists. Amazon does a deployment every second of every day. Right, you couldn't do that with the monolithic application. So this is, uh, I'm also gonna give you homework, something actionable. So this is an example of scale. DevOps as she has broken, as she has spoken at scale, comes from this nice book that Google made available for free. So this is DevOps at Google. And I'm not gonna say Google is the best at every possible thing. And there's a bunch of the stuff in that book that's not gonna apply to anyone unless they work at Google. But where's your book? Where's the book he wrote? So we'll, we'll, we'll listen to him. Because Google stands as a, as a proof that Google could exist, right? And I think Google's pretty awesome. So in this book, they talk about developers and operations can and should work together. They talk about solving system administration with software development. They talk about participating in a global community sharing solutions. In fact, the book itself is them sharing solutions, right? And I would also say that each one of these, if you go through the chapters and the practices and the rest of it, is covered in, in depth, at least from the Google perspective. So this is your homework. This is something hopefully is actionable, and this will probably take you half an hour of your life, and you know, I don't think you'll regret it. Read the embracing risk, the service level objectives, and the eliminating toil. And this also starts to connect to uh, what you're gonna hear from the next speaker, because while I, I do like to talk about the, the humans involved as, as first principles, what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of work that humans have to do, right? We wanna build systems that are negligible to operate. Google gets force multiplication by the fact that through the SRE process, through the SREs, building certain things, their architectural principles of how they use the infrastructure and put things together, that the overhead of operating these things is negligible. Right, and then as a bonus chapter in the, in the last part about um, management, you should read the communication and collaboration SRE if you're so inclined. But you don't have to do anything. So why is greater than what? I've already said that before. The thing that will also come from reading this book and the anecdotes that Google gives you about how they got to where they're at and some of the incidents they had and some of the processes that evolved is that they changed their behavior. They didn't start with something and then that was the thing forever. They have built into their system this process of organizational learning. And I, these are questions you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to answer, but I want you to think about it because I think it's important. Who, in the organization you're in, who puts as much thought into how the organization is designed, how the organization communicates it, with itself as they do to the, to the systems they're building? And how many of our organizations are able and willing to change those systems? And how, much, how many of us are willing and able to change ourselves? 
and this is something I believe very strongly, and it's very easy to measure if you're doing something like music or playing chess, because you, you can play a better player, right? Or you can play a better song. But you haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. So if you read Hacker News, and you do the same thing at work every day, you didn't learn, you're just collecting trivia, you're just collecting information, it's not learning. You have to change your behavior. And the organization that can learn is one that has the capacity to integrate people and structures in order to move towards continuous learning and change. And there's ways to build organizations and there's ways to build processes that help you be better at the work you're doing. So to kind of put a fine point on and come to the close, no one really set out to do DevOps, continuous delivery, microservices. Those were natural Darwinian consequences, right? That was not something Netflix didn't start and say, we're gonna do continuous delivery. They wanted to build these things that would scale. They wanted to build these things that have these failure characteristics and there's no other way to do that. There's no, there's no other existing architecture that accomplishes that. So don't fixate on any of these buzzwords. Don't fixate on any of the tools. Fixate on the outcomes. How can you get the outcome? How can you change the behavior? The principles are greater than the practices are greater than the tools. If you understand the principles, the practices and the tools will be obvious. Mindset is greater than skill set is greater than tool set. Adapt is greater than adopt. The problem is not technical, and the problem is not people. The problem is socio-technical. Right? These are integrated systems that are all together. It's the people and the machines together building these things, delivering these things. So we have to recognize them as first class and solve them both together. And it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives, it is the one that is most adaptable to change. There's actually no evidence Darwin ever said that, but it's often quoted. So what happens next? I'm not actually sure, but I'm pretty sure it's change. And my next talk, <laughs> the science of why you shouldn't change everything at once. <laughs> and I don't hope to have answers. I always hope to ask better questions. And just to close, because Pivotal pays my expenses, Pivotal is uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Thank you for your time, merci.